This building may not be very familiar to you, but I'm sure that the magazines we make inside are. This is the home of Future Publishing, Europe's biggest publisher of computers magazines. My name's Steve Jarrett, and I'm the editor of one of those magazines, perhaps the best known of all, Amiga Format. Before we get down to business, perhaps you'd like to take a look inside. These are the offices of the biggest, best, and most famous Amiga magazine, Amiga Format. And here are a few of the people that work long and hard to bring you the most read Amiga magazine on the newsstands. Behind me is Sue White, Amiga Format's art editor. She's responsible for making sure the magazine looks as good as it does. This is Richard Jones. He's our production editor. He reads everything we write, takes out all the spelling mistakes, and makes sure it's fit to print. And this is Nick Veach, consultant editor and Amiga Format's resident technical expert. Anyway, let's leave them to get on with their work. Let's go to my desk. Without doubt, the Amiga is a wonderful computer. But whichever model you have, you'll soon start to see its limitations. Whether the workbench or kickstart is a bit out of date, you want to add some mass storage or a CD drive, or just don't quite know how to install a Zorro card or a new floppy drive. This video will take you through the procedures in a step-by-step, easy-to-follow fashion. Now, over to our expert. I hope you find this tutorial useful and informative. Welcome to this Amiga Format video, a guide to expanding your Amiga computer. The Amiga is one of the most powerful home computers ever made and the key to that power is its incredible expansion capability. There are hundreds of extra peripherals which you can add to your computer to create the ideal system for you or to update to run the very latest software. In this video we'll be looking at ways to improve your computer no matter what model of Amiga you own. One of the first peripherals you will want to get for your Amiga is an external disk drive. This will be especially true if you have an A500, A600 or an A1200 without a hard drive as many programs will have you keep swapping disks until your arm is very sore. Fitting an external disk drive is remarkably easy. The drives can be obtained from any of the dealers advertising in Amiga format, and they cost between £50 and £100, depending on features. Some have anti-click devices, virus checkers or copiers built in. It's up to you how much you should spend. To connect the new drive, first make sure the Amiga is switched off. Now connect the 23-way lead from the disk drive to the connector at the back of the computer. The connector is cunningly labelled disk drive. If necessary, you should screw any fixing screws home to avoid the cable coming loose. Check if there is an enable switch on the drive, and if so, switch it on. You won't be able to operate this switch after the Amiga has been switched on, as the drive will only be recognised at boot up time. Position the drive so it's quite stable. Most people put it on top of the casing, like this. Now switch on the computer. It should boot as normal, and you should be able to hear the new drive clicking. When you put a disk in the drive, you should see the access light flash. and a new icon will appear on the workbench. When running application programs, it is usual to keep the workbench disk in the internal drive and run the application program from the other drive. This should keep disk swaps to a minimum. Soon after you add an extra disk drive, you'll find there is something else you need more of. And that something is memory as you can see from this demonstration. The standard size of memory in an A500 is 512K. On the other hand, an A500 Plus has one megabyte. An A600 also has one megabyte, but an A1200 has two megabytes. It won't be long before you realize that this usually isn't enough, and you'll need to add more. Sometimes, a lot of unexplained crashes or gurus can be put down to a lack of memory. The good news is that all these computers have special trapdoor slots, which makes adding memory relatively easy. The memory these computers come with is called chip memory, and any extra memory is called fast memory. Adding fast memory will generally improve the performance of your computer, and in the case of the A1200, will almost double the speed. Before you open up any computer or handle any peripheral, you should be aware of the dangers posed by static electricity. Everyone has felt a shock at some point 
perhaps when getting out of a car on a sunny day, or walking on a particular carpet. The shock you feel is actually a very high voltage discharging. Sometimes there may be a tiny spark and a small crackling noise. Although harmless to humans, if unpleasant, a static shock can be fatal to a computer. You should be careful not to touch the pins of a chip or any exposed components with your bare hands, if possible. To minimise the risk of static shocks, try to use a good quality grounding strap, like this. The strap fits around the wrist and connects to a good earth point, for example, a radiator. If you don't have a suitable strap, you can make sure you always touch a metal object, like a radiator or a water tap, immediately before you touch any electrical components. Grounding yourself in this way will discharge any static electricity which may have built up on your person. The other potential danger when dealing with electrical equipment is an electric shock from mains electricity. It is extremely unlikely that you will ever come near any mains voltages inside your Amiga equipment, but it is always a good idea to disconnect all leads and cables before taking anything else apart. Never take apart the mains transformer, as it contains a large transformer and components which can retain a charge for several hours. So before we go on, here are some other precautions you might like to bear in mind. Always use a grounding strap, if possible, to avoid damaging equipment with static electricity. If you haven't got a strap, touch an earth metal object. Try not to touch the exposed parts of any components or circuit boards. Always disconnect all leads before opening a computer. Never insert or remove leads whilst the computer is switched on. Never open mains transformers or monitors. They contain voltages high enough to kill. Let's deal with the Amiga 500 first. Switch the computer off and disconnect all the cables that are leading into the back of the machine. Turn it upside down and place it on a table. It's a good idea to put it on a towel to stop it from moving around. When you've opened the trap door, and a coin normally does the trick, place it to one side. You should now be able to see the connectors where the memory board fits. Take the memory board out of its protective wrapper and insert it into the computer like so. The instructions which come with the board will tell you which way round it goes, but usually the memory chips will face away from you. If there is a switch on the board, make sure it is in the on position. When you've replaced the lid and turned the Amiga back over, reconnect all the leads and switch on. The computer should boot as normal, but the amount of free memory available at the top of the screen will have changed. To see exactly how much memory is now present, open a shell window and type in the command avail. These four columns will now display the amount of memory. The maximum figure should reflect the extra memory that you've added. Memory can also be added to the A500 via the expansion slot in the side of the machine. This is done in almost exactly the same way, except the expansion units themselves may have a through slot so you can add further devices, and also many come with their own power supply. The procedure for adding memory to the trapdoor slot of the A600 is exactly the same as the procedure we've seen for the A500. The only difference is that the trapdoor connector is of a slightly different type, so you will need a memory card which is made specifically for the A600. For the A1200, simply repeat the same process as for the A500. Some A1200 memory cards are quite large, and fitting them requires quite a bit of manual dexterity. Some are so large that the trapdoor lid won't fit on properly at all. The A600 and A1200 both come with special card slots. These accept cards which conform to the PCM CIA standard. At the moment there are only a few peripherals which connect to this slot, but that will change in the near future. Memory cards are often added here. In fact, it's the only way of adding more memory to an A600 once the trapdoor slot has been filled. Unfortunately, adding memory using the PCM CIA slot means that the memory isn't particularly fast. It is also rather expensive, so always try to add memory to the trapdoor slot first. Some cards also include battery back clocks.
These will remember the time when the computer is switched off and are especially useful in keeping track of when files were created. If the board does have a clock, you will see a miniature battery on the memory board, like this one. You may need to set the clock before it can be used, using the date command from the workbench preferences drawer. Let's see how this is done on the A1200. Locate the time preference program in the prefs drawer and double click. This utility allows you to set the time and even the date. So I'll set it to my birthday and the time I was born, which was approximately half past eleven. So I'm reliably informed. When we click on save, that time will be saved to the battery back clock. And obviously it will remember it any time you use the computer in the future. The software which drives the Amiga's operating system is called the Kickstart. And depending on which Amiga model you have, the Kickstart is stored on one or two ROM, or read-only memory chips. Early Amiga 500s came with an earlier version of Kickstart, which means these computers cannot run Workbench 2.04. This version of Workbench is widely accepted as the minimum configuration, and anyone still using 1.3 will find a lot of new software won't work properly. Upgrading the A500 to use the new ROM isn't a particularly hard thing to do, although depending on the version of the Amiga, it may be necessary to make an extra solder connection. If you own a lot of older game software, it is only fair to point out that some will refuse to work with the Kickstart ROM fitted. If this should be the case, you might like to consider using a ROM switcher. To change the ROM on an A500, you will need to first take the computer apart, remove the screws holding it together, and take off the top lid. Remove the keyboard and place it to one side. You can disconnect the keyboard from the motherboard, but take care to make a note of the correct way to refit the cable. Normally, you would then have to remove the shielding from the motherboard uh, by bending back the metal tabs. In this case, this being my personal machine, we don't have to do that because I took mine off and threw it away a long time ago. Be careful when you are doing this procedure, actually, because the shielding is very sharp, as you can see from my injured finger. Locate the ROM and note where the notch is. You can remove it either with a proper chip extractor or a pair of screwdrivers. If you're using screwdrivers, you must do it very slowly and carefully, trying not to touch the legs. This ROM we've loosened earlier, but I'll demonstrate the technique with a pair of screwdrivers now. You should just rock the ROM gently backwards and forwards until it comes loose and you can pull it free. If you have an A500 Plus, you may notice that the ROM chip is smaller than the ROM socket itself, so make sure you've used the correct pin. And now, if you're replacing the ROM without a switcher, you can put the new ROM in now. If the legs of the ROM chip seem to be spread too wide, you can press them gently against the desk surface to bend them back into shape. If the new Kickstart ROM doesn't seem to be working, this could be because some older Amigas require that an extra link is made between pins 1 and 31 of the ROM. This is best done on the ROM switcher itself. If you have a ROM switcher, you can drill a small hole and mount the ROM switcher's control switch at the back of the A500's case, towards the right behind the joystick group. Keyboard control switches are available, which will have their own instructions. Testing the new ROM isn't hard. When reassembled and switched on, the new Kickstart should create a new inserted disk display. Agnes is a custom chip fitted to the A500, and it controls various aspects of the computer, including the chip memory, where graphics and sound effects are stored. Older Amiga 500s came with an Agnes which could only address half a megabyte of chip RAM. But newer versions of the chip are available, which can address a full megabyte of memory, assuming there is a compatible half-meg memory board fitted to the trapdoor. The advantages of the larger Agnes include the ability to load more sound samples and run complicated programs such as desktop publishing software more efficiently. You can check which version of Agnes you have 
by either looking to see how much chip RAM you have available at the workbench, or checking the number on top of the chip itself. The hardest part of fitting a new Agnes is actually removing the old one. Don't be tempted into using a screwdriver to wedge the chip out. You'll only crack the socket. You must use the proper extraction tool. If you don't want to buy one, ask your local TV repairman to remove the chip for you, as he's bound to have the right tool. Check the orientation. There should be a mark on the chip and a notch or an arrow on the socket. And install the new Agnes. Depending on what machine you have, it may now be necessary to make a few circuit board alterations. On a Revision 6A machine, JP2 should have only the top two pads connected. And JP7A should have none of the pads connected at all. Obviously, if you decide to perform these modifications yourself, or indeed any of the other upgrades we've shown you in this video, Neither Future Publishing, Amiga Format, nor indeed myself will be held responsible for any damage you may cause. But if you follow our advice, you should be alright. It is also possible to buy the 2 megabyte version of Agnes, which is used in the A1200 and the A4000. These replacement chips usually come on a special circuit board, which includes the new 2 megabytes of memory. The big box Amigas, the A1500, 2000, 3000 and 4000, all have internal expansion slots called Zorro slots. Many peripherals come in the form of Zorro cards, including video cards, memory cards, hard drive controllers, CD-ROM interfaces, voice mail systems, the list goes on and on. Fitting these cards is easy. First switch off the computer and remove all mice, joysticks and power cables. Then unscrew the rear of the case and slip the lid off. Here are the Zorro slots in an A2000. Notice these extra sockets over here. These are for PC cards, which can only be used if a special PC emulator called a bridge board is fitted. Notice also this video slot. This slot is reserved for cards which require access to the Amiga's video signals. In the A4000, the slots are arranged horizontally, and the video slot has been moved to be in line with the Zorro slot. Fitting a card first requires the back plane cover to be removed. You should unscrew it like this. It is a, a Phillips head screw. And remove it carefully and put it aside. Now the new card simply slots in like this. Push it firmly down to make sure it's in place. Before putting the lid back on, check that any jumpers on the card have been set properly. If your Amiga already has plenty of cards present, you'll probably find it easier to set the jumpers before inserting the card. The Amiga 4000 has several SIM sockets on the motherboard to accommodate extra memory. There are four sockets for fast RAM and one for chip RAM, so up to 18 megabytes can be present at one time. Depending on how your Amiga is configured, you may have a one megabyte SIM of chip RAM. If you do have one megabyte of chip RAM, it's a good idea to replace this with a two megabyte SIM as your first expansion. Simply remove the one megabyte SIM and insert a two megabyte one in its place. If the other fast memory SIMs are also 1 megabyte, the 1 megabyte SIM can be inserted here. However, if there is a 4 megabyte SIM present in the fast memory slot, then any other 4 megabyte SIMs can be fitted. If you are changing your fast memory from 1 megabyte to 4 megabyte SIMs, you will need to set this jumper here. Adding a second IDE hard drive to an Amiga 4000 is relatively straightforward. Most 3.5 inch low profile IDE drives are suitable. The first step is to remove the entire drive bay by unscrewing the four screws which hold it in place. You will then need to consult the hard drive documentation to find out which jumpers to set. The original drive should be set to be a master drive 
and the second drive should be a slave drive. Screw the second drive into place, attach the power and the data cable, and refit the drive bay. On boot up, we can use HD Toolbox to configure the drive, including making partitions, setting advanced options, and actually formatting the drive itself. Okay, that just about rounds up this brief look at upgrading your machine. Remember, whatever modifications you make are at your own risk. Future Publishing, Amiga Format, and myself will certainly not be held responsible for any damage you may cause. But if you follow our advice, you should be okay. I hope this video has been useful for you, and maybe I'll see you again in another video in this series. Bye-bye. We've produced this series of videos as part of our commitment to you, our readers. If you have any suggestions on how we should improve the videos or the magazine itself, please write to me, Steve Jarrett, at the address at the end of this video. Thanks for joining us. Hope to see you again soon. Additional videos in the Amiga format range include Personal Paint, an introduction to the A1200, A1200 hard drives, upgrading your machine, Music X, Multimedia, Desktop Video Volume 1, Desktop Video Volume 2, and finally, the Amiga Format Guide to Clarissa. Priced at just $14.99 each, or any three for $34.95, they represent excellent value for money. For further details, contact BVG at the address given at the end of this video.